On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with NDE researcher and lead investigator of the AWARE project, Dr. Sam Parnia. But then later on in that same presentation, you say, if near-death experience is an illusion, a trick of the mind, which it may well be, and I suspect it will turn out to be. So there you're saying that after looking at all these cases, collaborating with other indie researchers, that your current position is that you suspect, your hunch is that these NDE cases are probably an illusion. Now, that's not a problem. That's not a criticism. It's just I'm trying to understand that is where you're coming from, right? No. The current scientific models that we have, okay, and this is the point I think I was trying to mention in that uh, quote that you said. The current scientific models that we have do not um, allow for the descriptions that patients are providing of uh, an out-of-body experience, if they're real. It's okay to say, you know, I've done all this research and I'm leaning towards suspecting that that's how it's going to turn out to be. I mean, what's the problem with that? I don't think there is a problem. Okay. You do suspect that it'll turn out to be a trick of the mind, an illusion. It may well be. I'm, you know, you're pushing me and I'm giving you an honest answer. I don't know. If I knew the answers, then I don't think I would have engaged 10, 12 years of my life and so much of my medical and scientific reputation to try to do this. As you appreciate, people like me I risk a lot by doing this sort of experiment. So um, I'm interested in the answers, and I don't know. But like I said, if I was to base everything on the knowledge that I have currently of neuroscience, then the easiest uh, explanation is that this is probably an illusion. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and on this episode of Skeptico, I have an interview with Dr. Sam Parnia. Now, this is an interview that many of us, including myself, have anticipated for quite some time. Dr. Parnia is well known as being the lead investigator of the AWARE Project. And the AWARE project is quite unique, probably because the amount of media attention that it's received, given that they haven't really published any results. Articles in Time magazine, in all the science pubs in the U.S., and in Europe. And a lot of folks are looking to the AWARE project to be the definitive research on whether near-death experiences are scientifically valid. Now, the mere framing of this project as being such a definitive answer to a question that so many researchers have looked into for so long made me a little bit uncomfortable. But what made me even more uncomfortable was looking into the details of the methodology and some of the assumptions that were being made. And I published some concerns that I had a few months ago in a podcast and in a blog entry on the website. And in this interview, Dr. Samparnia was nice enough to come on and hash these issues out. And these are kind of hard issues to hash out, especially, it seems, for Dr. Parnia. I get the sense, and I don't want to stretch this too far because I don't want to assume too much what his motives are, but if you listen carefully to what he's saying, he seems to be trying to play a delicate balancing act and not offend too many people on either side and to keep the project going and to keep funding going and and to balance competing interests. And again, I I don't want to explore that too far, even though that's a very interesting topic, maybe for another subject. What I really wanted to do here was just get to some bottom line answers on what this research is all about. And while I got part of the way there, I didn't get all the way there. And that got me thinking about the previous episode of Skeptico with Dr. Jeff Kripal. And Dr. Kripal, if you remember, is the head of the religion department at Rice University, and he's an expert in comparative religions. But he's also very interested in consciousness research and all sorts of topics related to how we probe into parapsychology and the paranormal and all these things that seem to be impenetrable. And his point was that it's difficult to do because culture is embedded in the narrative that we create when we look into these things. And we explored on the last episode how uncomfortable that sometimes makes us folks who want logic and reason and everything to work out like a formula. But I have to say, after doing this interview with Dr. Parnia, I had a deeper appreciation for what Jeff Kripal had to say on the last episode. 
I mean, how close can Dr. Parnia get to the truth, given his cultural background, his educational background, his political background as a physician inside of a hospital? What are the built-in limitations in where he can really go in this research? Well, I'm not sure I have the answers to those questions, but they are questions that I hope to probe in future episodes of Skeptico, because as this interview with Dr. Sam Parnia demonstrates, we can only get so far by just following the data. We're joined today by the author of What Happens When We Die. He's a leading expert in NDE research. He's best known as the lead investigator of the AWARE Project. Dr. Sam Parnia is a fellow in pulmonary care at Cornell University and Well, he's a doctor. I mean, in addition to being a researcher, he's also there in the ICU saving lives. Dr. Parnia, thanks so much for joining me today on Skeptico. My pleasure. Well, it's really my pleasure to have you on, and your work has generated a lot of interest, and the little bit of exchange we've had has generated a lot of interest. A couple months ago, I did publish a post and suggesting that the AWARE study of consciousness during clinical death, I suggested that maybe that was doomed to fail. And you were nice enough to join me on the show today and kind of discuss that a little bit. So let me start with this. In replying to my post, you suggested that maybe I had misrepresented the AWARE project when I said it seeks to verify out-of-body experience after clinical death. Perhaps you'd like to clarify what the AWARE project is and maybe what that misrepresentation was. One of the things that's really interesting to me is trying to understand what happens to, as you pointed out, I work in an intensive care unit. And one of the things that I find most interesting is trying to understand what happens to patients when they're critically ill, and in particular when they have died, which is basically a cardiac arrest. So cardiac arrests and death are synonymous, and most people don't realize that. And we deal with a number of patients who have cardiac arrests in hospitals. And what we've come to understand is that in order for us to improve the medical care of these patients, and make sure that we can bring them back to life again and improve their neurological outcomes, in other words, making sure that they don't have any brain damage, that we have to do more and more research. And so what science has done in recent years is essentially develop this field of resuscitation science, which is essentially the science of bringing people back to life again. And inadvertently, in studying uh, the processes that take place when somebody dies, such as what happens to the brain, we also had to study what happens to their mind and consciousness. In other words, what are the mental processes that take place to an individual when they've gone through the process of death? And what we've learned is that death, very much uh, contrary to the public perception, is not a moment, it's actually a process, and that it's reversible for a varying length of time, which now stands at least for over an hour of time, and there are case reports of people who've been there for three to four hours. And so the AWARE study which is short for Awareness During Resuscitation, is a multi-defensive study that was designed to both address some of the important issues that are needed in trying to improve the outcome of patients who have a cardiac arrest when we bring them back to life again, Um, and also at the same time not ignoring the fact that people seem to have consciousness and memories from the period of cardiac arrest. In other words, the evidence that we have so far suggests that people can have mental activity after they've died and have had a cardiac arrest. What's fascinating about this aspect of the work is that people describe some elements um, that are somewhat subjective. For example, people will describe seeing a bright light, they may describe seeing a tunnel, they may describe seeing deceased relatives who have almost welcomed them through the process of death to comfort them. But those things are really not scientifically testable because they're subjective. However, a group of people claim that they can see doctors and nurses working on them And they say they can describe in specific details what had happened to them. And I've studied hundreds of these cases before, as have many other people. And so part of what we wanted to do was to set up an experiment that would objectively test the claims that people have when they had had a cardiac arrest, should they claim that they could see that the nurse is working on them. Because we don't know at this point whether these claims are correct. In other words, do people really see things from the ceiling? Or is it just some kind of illusion? And that's really essentially what the... uh, the experiment was about. I hear you loud and clear there that the AWARE project is broader than just an NDE study, and I understand that even the term near-death experience is something that you're not totally comfortable with for the reasons that you just enumerated there in terms of your understanding and your evolving understanding of the dying process. But I, I have to say, you know, in what you just said there, 
there is a little bit of a, a riddle always wrapped in what you say. And I think you yourself, as being the lead investigator and the person that a lot of folks look to in this research, are a little bit of a, a, an enigma, hard to understand. Some people think, hey, that guy is uh, is too welcoming, too much of an NDE proponent. Other folks I've heard say that you're too much of a skeptic to really give near-death experience a fair shot. So I thought one of the things that would be interesting today is maybe pull apart some of the things that you just said there. And I'll give you an example. In the email response you sent to me, here's one thing you said about the big picture of consciousness. You said, as I'm sure you are aware, there are many different theories for why near-death experience occur. And now here's the next part that really caught my attention. The main issue is to realize all human experience is triggered by the brain. Now, this really struck me as a little bit odd. I mean, I thought that was supposed to be kind of the central question in this research. Can consciousness exist outside of the brain? So I was a little surprised that, you know, you had stated it that emphatically, particularly when it seems like a lot of your colleagues, other NDE researchers and other consciousness researchers as well, seem to be much less emphatic in stating that consciousness cannot exist outside of the brain. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I think the problem is uh, this is the problem of emails, because obviously, you know, um, there's not that much explanation. I think there's a key point that's been missing. Um, and therefore, um, I think with all respect, you, you've made an incorrect conclusion from what I've said. What I was referring to was that, um, unfortunately, in the field of near-death experiences, since you brought that up, there's been a general neglect in terms of research. And so if you look at the medical literature and the things that people talk about in the media, it's generally theories rather than anything that's been substantiated through proper scientific research. So, for example, one of the things that's more of a perception out there in society is that the sort of so-called scientific explanation of near-death experiences is that this is due to a lack of oxygen or some other chemical process affecting the brain. And the point that I was trying to make is that although this has never been validated, so for example, there are no experiments that demonstrate that uh, lack of oxygen causes near-death experiences or any other process, or any other chemical process leads to a near-death experience. We have to accept that when people die, of course, there are chemical changes that are taking place in the brain, and we may not have yet discovered what those are that correlate with a near-death experience. However, the point to realize, and this is important, is that... I if science one day identifies what those chemicals and those processes are, let's say it's region X of the brain and it involves chemicals uh, Y and Z, how does that tell us whether the near-death experience was real or not? Unfortunately, the problem is that a lot of people have drawn the, in my opinion, incorrect conclusion that just because you identify a chemical process, that then automatically means that an experience is a hallucination. And that's the point I'm trying to make. It doesn't, because in fact, every human experience is mediated by the brain. So if that was the correct argument, then we'd have to say that when somebody feels love, uh, just because we can trace the chemical triggers of love in the brain, that actually someone's maternal love towards their five-year-old is not real. It's a hallucination, you see. So the point I was trying to make is that, yes, we don't know what those chemical triggers are. One day we may identify them, but that still doesn't dictate the reality of an experience. And reality is actually not defined by any neurological trigger in relation to any experience. So that was the first point I was trying to make. The point about consciousness that you raised, um, as you know, the question of how the human consciousness or the self or the soul or the mind um, arises, the psyche as the Greeks called it, has been a question that has intrigued humanity for as long as we know. And essentially ever since the time of Aristotle and Plato, there have been two broad categories of views. One is... Um, more in tune with Aristotle's belief that essentially, although there is a human soul, that the soul is nothing more than the product of bodily processes. And there are others who follow Plato who believe that actually the human so-called soul or psyche, as the Greeks called it, and now we call it consciousness or the mind, um, is basically a separate uh, entity to bodily processes and therefore lives on after death. Again, the point I've tried to make is that at this point, we don't know scientifically uh, which one of these is correct. Again, there is some sort of perception that the scientific explanation is that more in tune with Aristotle's belief. But again, it's a belief. There's no experiment that's shown how thoughts can be generated from the brain and consciousness could arise from brain processes. And so that really is a question that we're trying to answer. And I think um, depending on the, res the appropriate experiments, and I hope that the AWARE study will be the first of many such experiments that will start. And like with any scientific endeavor, 